Hey guys, Ronnie Calhoun here with Miss Lou Champion Spotlight. In the studio this evening, we have Dr. Stephen Olmos and uh, Dr. Casey Morris. How are y'all doing? Great. Glad to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to have y'all here. I'm super excited Appreciate about it. this. Um, I wanted to get you guys in. I called, uh, I called you, Casey, to ask about coming in because um, what you guys are going to talk about today is something that has impacted me personally, as you know, um, and in a very positive way. So this is something that I want to share information with our viewers because I think it's something that could potentially um, have someone. a positive impact on a lot of people. So... Um, Dr. Casey, you've been here, and uh, Dr. Morris, you've been here for how, how long? I've been practicing since uh, 2007, so right at 15 years. Wow. I met Dr. Almos in 2016 um, in Memphis at the University of Tennessee. He was given a, a mini residency at that time. Okay. Dr. Almos, you've been at it for how long? Uh, 41 years. 41 years, <laughs> okay. And we'll get to that a little bit uh, more in a minute, but... Um, so you went to Pepperdine for your undergrad, mm -hmm. yes. um, Southern Cal for dental school. That's right. And we've got a, I've got a list of credentials here for, for Dr. O that uh, we're going to put on the screen, but it, it would take me half the show to read the credentials. But um, past president of the American Academy of Craniofacial Pain. Mm -hmm. yes. So uh, some very, some very um, impressive credentials here. And we'll, we'll put those on the screen. You have 66 clinics in seven different countries. Um, you, your practice is the TMJ and Sleep Therapy Center of San Diego. That's correct. That's where you practice. Yes. Okay. Um, so you, we were talking about, we'll kind of dive in now. Um, we were talking about you've been practicing for 41 years. But the past 27, you have been exclusively treating chronic pain and sleep breathing disorders. Yes, that's, that's right. right. Mm -hmm. Okay, why don't, why don't you kind of uh, explain what that means to, in regular terms? Sure. You know, so um, what I treat is um, chronic facial pain, jaw problems, nerve injuries like trigeminal neuralgia, all term, terms of neuralgia in the head. Um, occipital, glossopharyngeal, um, we treat uh, headaches, so primary headaches like migraine, tension type, cluster headaches. Um, primary headaches are headaches that don't have an organic origin. You know, in other words, there's no bleeding in the brain, there's no tumor, MRIs are negative, but the person's head still hurts. So it's, you know, our, my job to kind of figure out what that is okay. and work with neurologists and work with other, you know, medical professionals to find the solutions for those problems. And then we also treat breathing disorders. So people who um, their throat closes while they sleep, um, where sometimes their brain cuts, cuts out and causes issue, um, where they have nasal obstruction, they have to mouth breathe, you know, so snoring the whole gamut all the way through. So those are the things that we treat on a daily basis. I know for me personally, I had a, a really bad lower back. Um, I've had, a, I've flipped a Bronco four times and several things. And uh, I've got some degenerative disc disease going and stuff like that. And uh, Dr. Morris and I did a volunteer. We did a charity event together. And I was in a bad spot. I mean, I just was, I didn't even realize how bad it was. And um, until that next day, I couldn't even hardly get out of bed. I mean, we worked hard that night. And I mean, I, I just couldn't even get out of bed. And I was just laying there thinking, I mean, I had a tear in my eye. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Um, and it was funny because I think it was later that same day that she reached out to me and she said, Hey, Ronnie, I, I, you, go, you may think that I'm crazy, but I may be able to help you with your back. And so, uh, I said, Hey, I'll try anything. Let's do it. And I came into the office and she started telling me more about your teachings and some of the things that she's learned from you. And I said, let's do it. You know, I mean, it makes so much sense to me. And, um, my results, I was doing physical therapy too at the time. And it was like, we couldn't ever get over the hump. It was, it was working, but I'd never could heal. And once I started doing this with it, it was like the healing really started taking place. And my life has been so much better off since, since we did this. So, um, that's kind of my, my story behind yeah, it's it. It's wonderful. Um, but what other things, what, 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 what can this fix? You know, what, what can you help with? 
well, the chronic <laughs> face pain and jaw locking and um, headaches and neck aches. And so that in itself uh -huh. is enough for most people. But I think your situation is one of where um, there's problems in the head that affects the whole rest of your body. And conversely, you can have problems in the rest of your body that um, cause pain in your face. Uh, for instance, let's say you have an injured foot or knee, and as you walk around on that all day, you kind of favor it because you don't, your brain doesn't want to put weight on it. But it hurts. So there's all this tension. So you tend to start clenching during the day. Your face hurts, you know. Um, and, and so the presentation of the problem is in your face. Face, but the real problem is somewhere else or conversely you can have a problem in your head that then is affecting the rest of your body and that was kind of your situation mm -hmm. so you had a problem in your jaw and it was inflamed and every time you swallow it hurt you know because there was swelling in your jaw joint mm -hmm. so just as you would change the way you walk if you had a badly twisted ankle you would favor it so you'd have a different way that you carry yourself because your brain says i don't want to put any more weight on that because it already hurts okay and the problem in chronic pain is is that it usually hurts on the opposite side of the problem okay because in an acute injury a recent injury you get hit in the face it hurts where you get hit but if the body can't heal that, then it starts to compensate. So it doesn't, you know, aggravate that injury. So like if I have a right ankle that's twisted, my brain is going to say, I'm not putting weight on that. I'm going to put weight on the other arm, uh, other leg. And so then your knee and your hip and your ankle of the other leg starts hurting and you go get treatment for that, but it never gets better. And the reason why it never gets better is they're treating the symptom, not the origin. So what we do is we try to figure out where, what is the origin of these problems? Because the way most people um, treat wh whatever their specialty is that people get treated for what they complain about. And so if my back hurts, somebody's going to work on my back. But they do more and more invasive things, but they don't get any benefit. So to me, if you keep doing more and more invasive things on an area, but you're not seeing improvement, there should be a red light that comes on that's spinning that goes, maybe we don't have the right part. Maybe what we're treating is the compensation, not the real origin problem. Mm -hmm. Because if it were, it would get better, right? Kind of makes sense. Yeah. So, so we look for origin to find compensation. And so in your case, the jaw hurt every time you swallow. And the person swallows like 1,800, 2,500 times a day. Mm -hmm. So they keep poking it. See, your teeth come together when you swallow, and that, that, that's the closest your lower jaw goes up in your skull. And if it hurts right there, then you just keep irritating it. You know, it's like an open wound. You keep poking, right? So you have adaptive postures. You start to lean forward, okay? Oh, yeah, we know about that. Now. And as you start <laughs> leaning forward, then for every inch your head is forward of your shoulder, it adds 10 pounds of weight to your neck and your low back. So a lot of these people who have this forward head posture, um, then they're compressing their cervical spine, their lumbar spine. So if you go through life like that, that in itself can produce injury to where somebody might think you need surgical intervention. But what if you were like that, you know, already, and then you have a car wreck, you have a whiplash, you roll your truck over your Bronco or yeah. whatever. And, and, and so now all the people who are trying to help you are trying to get you upright, but you were never upright before. So you're, now you're in the same position you were, but now you have all these injured parts that now you're compressing even greater. So you have more pain. So that's why the physical therapy isn't going to work because they're assuming that you were all okay before that, and you mm -hmm. never were, mm -hmm. okay? So that's where we have to get to the origin problem to get you upright. Mm -hmm. So not, now the therapies that you're getting actually work, Yeah. okay? Yeah. And that's how you build a team. Mm -hmm. So what we do is we triage and find out what the parts are in the order in which they need to be treated so that we can collaborate with other, uh, you know, healthcare people, you know, um, physical therapists, chiropractors, orthopedists, um, neurologists, whoever we need, um, mm -hmm. in order to, as a team, make the person better, okay? Because no one person can fix yeah. everything. And, but it's about figuring out what that is. And so that's, that's what we do. We, we figure out what the order is to treat a person. And in your case, of all the injuries you had, it was your brain was more worried about your jaw than it was the things they were working on. Yeah. Okay? And that's why you weren't getting anywhere. Yeah. But what she did is she got your head up. And when she got your head up, 
now all the pressure was reduced and now the physical therapist could could do what they wanted to do they were trying to get your head up but it wasn't for them to do yeah. it was for her to do so what she did is she put things in your mouth to keep the pressure to keep the bones from touching and as soon as your brain figured out that it's not hurting anymore to swallow it didn't it uprighted itself okay i published a paper on this Oh gosh, um, 17 years ago now, where we actually quantified the amount of uprighting people get when they have this condition like you do. And we found, and, and the population uh, base of the study was age 13 to 74 years of age, so all different ages, okay? And we found that we could upright someone 4.43 inches on average of all these different ages okay that's wow. the average wow so that means that's 40 pounds that's, that's 40, 40, almost 40 45 pounds, pounds yeah. of weight that we took off people's necks and back can you imagine walking around with a big bag of dog food on your neck that's what i felt back? like i was doing well that's wow. what that's yeah. what you were doing that's what that's that's the difference right there yeah. wow yeah i mean <clears throat> when she when she first started explaining it to me she was explaining it and i'm very open because like i told you earlier today um when you're the patient I don't care who fixes it. I don't care what strategy is it. It doesn't matter to me. I just want to feel you better. Just want relief. I just yeah. want my life right. back. Hope. Um, you want hope. Yeah, I just want hope. You know, I want to feel better. Um, and she started. So that's why I was very open because I was like, look. Number one, I know she's smart. I know she's always staying ahead of the trends and everything. Mm -hmm. So I said, yeah, let's sit down. And she started talking to me about sleeping, and I was like. I mean, I, 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 might, I don't know if I sleep good. I mean, I, I probably don't because I roll all night because I, I'm hurting. But we did a sleep test, and, um, I mean, it was, it was bad. It was pretty rough. And, I, you know, she said, you're not sleeping very well. And um, So what that, what that means is not sleeping very well. What that means is you were suffocating at nighttime. Yeah. So to be more clear. Yeah. Yeah, because – People could interpret that meaning that, uh, you know, people are loud or something. You have disturbed sleep from from somebody else disturbing you. Mm -hmm. No, your sleep was disturbed because you were suffocating, mm -hmm. okay? So that wakes you up, you know, when you're struggling to breathe. Mm -hmm. See, we have to find out why is this jaw so sore? There has to be something going on every day that keeps it sore. Otherwise, it, it would heal, right? Mm -hmm. So the times at which we injure our jaw the most is when we're sleeping. Because, see, the way neurology works is that if, if I bite together the, the sensory endings that, that go to my brain, a, a somatic brain, your, your brain that you think about, um, that's the pathway. So in the daytime, I know how hard I'm biting. I can go, oh, gee, I'm, I'm, I can catch myself, you know. And Consciously. Can, yeah. yeah, and we can alter that. So it's like biofeedback, okay? We can do therapy. Um, but but at nighttime, that, that sensation does not go to your brain. It goes to your brain stem. And so you don't know how hard you're biting. So people can bite five times harder when they're asleep. So that's when they start damaging their teeth or their jaw or their face. And so you have to keep moving your jaw forward if your throat's closing. So there's all this action all night long. So the more frequent yeah. that you can't breathe, the more you have to do it. And maybe your nose is plugged up. Maybe you wake up and your mouth's dry because the air is going down your throat instead of up your nose. And then your nose is there for a reason. It's just not ornamental, <laughs> okay? Its function is to take this air that's full of all sorts of things and to filter it, moisten it, warm it, and mix it with gases that are in your sinuses called nitric oxide that kill viruses, bacteria, and fungus. So every nasal breath, you're drawing this gas into your lungs to protect you against COVID and everything else, okay? But if it's all plugged up, it goes right into your lungs unfiltered. Okay, so then, you, you know, you're more prone to respiratory problems and things like that. The gas is, has all these bodily functions. One of them is to cause your blood vessels in your periphery, like your fingers and your toes, to dilate so that there's less resistance. So now your blood pressure lowers. Okay, so breathing through your nose and having proper breathing is not only good for your, you know, your immune system, but it's all, also good for your cardiovascular system. And so when you sleep properly, you sleep restfully, okay? And now you sleep the whole night and you wake up and you're ready for your day. Um, so we know to ask questions about interruptions. So we first ask, well, do you wake up at night? 
Oh, yeah, I wake up all the night. <laughs> oh, but that's just to go to the bathroom. Because people think, you know, oh, I drank too much water. No, that's, that's not the reason. Your body produces uh, antidiuretics for nighttime, so you don't have to get up, okay? And the only reason that changes is if there's something that's causing that problem. And, you know, medications can and other things mm -hmm. as well. Um, and there's certain, you know, kind of urinary problems that people have. But in the absence of that, that's not everybody. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's a smaller percentage. But in the other larger category, well, that's actually a process of, of the problem of breathing. So what happens is, you know, if, you, if you're a person who's, uh, jaw and tongue kind of go back when you're asleep, you know, whatever position, and it blocks your airway, it's like having a cork in there. So your diaphragm is trying to draw in air, but it can't. So you have all this negative pressure on your chest. And what happens is it causes your right atrium to descend, uh, distend. And then that now has more uh, blood and fluid. And so that your body interprets that as you having too much fluid. So now it produces a diuretic hormone that causes you to have more urine, and that's why you have to go to the bathroom. Because that's how I found out I had a breathing problem. Uh, I used to wake up three times a night, okay, to go to the bathroom. All right. And I, yeah, you know, I thought every, I had like a ninety-year-old yeah, bladder. I'm it, like, something's wrong. Yeah. So you start to assume, or you know, you talk to your friends, and they say, "Oh, I do that too." You know. Yeah, well, it's just that we don't know how common this problem is. Turns out, I was suffocating. Okay, mm -hmm. and so then you know, a device was made for me that I could put in my mouth to keep my throat open. I had some nasal surgery, so my nose works now, mm -hmm. and now I sleep throughout the night um, uh, uninterrupted, and I drink water with my vitamins before I go to bed, so no issue. And so I am this much older, so I should have a bigger problem now mm -hmm. that I'm older, but actually I had more interrupted sleep 20, 30 years ago than I do now, okay? So, mm -hmm. so those are all markers for us. Those help us figure out why your jaw is so sore, okay? And then we address those problems, and guess what? At the same time, with the device, you're keeping the jaw from rubbing itself, so now the swelling can come down, mm -hmm. okay? So, and then that's why your head comes up. So, so it's a it's a it's a way to get to the origin problem, and and yeah. that's the that's the long term resolution. You're going to stay like this, okay? You're not going to go back to the way you were. That's the good news, okay? Wow. Well, unless, yeah. you, unless you choose to, you know. She, <clears throat> <laughs> unless you choose. Yeah, to. I mean, I didn't realize. <laughs> I, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I didn't realize how. I mean, I was. She saw it with her. You know, she saw me physically bent over. And um, whenever I went in, you know, she didn't tell me what she was doing. She was just like, stand here. And they were, turn, taking, they were taking pictures and this and that. I had no idea what they were doing, so I wasn't cheating or whatever. And um, when she showed it to me, I was like, oh, my Who's goodness. That? Is that me? Is, is that how I stand? Is that how I walk? And she's like, yeah, I could see it. You, you, um, should, you should do a program where... You show what you look like before, yeah, and what you look like now, yeah. I think it made me better looking too. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's Melissa better to be straight that. than it is to be all bent over, right? Yeah, <laughs> Melissa told no. me that. No, I, uh, no, I agree. I agree with you. We should do something like that. that. Well, that, I, I, that I would be open to that. Yeah, that, that would be, be visual for mm -hmm. people to actually see because you're trying to describe something. But if you could, if someone yeah. could see it, then they would go, "Oh, okay. yeah." I, I would gladly yeah. share that yeah. with the world because I mean, I. I as someone who has lived with chronic pain mm -hmm. and is kind of now on the other side of that, I don't want anybody to go through it. I don't really have many enemies, but the, the ones that I do, I don't, I don't want them to have to go through that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, that's And we just, get so used to the way we are. Yeah. And it comes on slow, one thing at a time, yeah, you know? Exactly. And then you just get used to that, and then the yeah. next symptom, and then the next. And before long, you're walking. Yeah, yeah. And it was a while ago you were saying... Um, you thirsty? I didn't realize, and that I, I didn't think about it until you said that. But I used to drink like three bottles of water during the night. I would just constantly pound water all night. I was always yeah, thirsty, dry. and mm -hmm. I've noticed now that I, I don't really do that anymore. But I didn't. I guess I didn't think about well, that. Well, one of the things is if you're nasally obstructed, your mouth breathing, so all the saliva is dried up. Okay, and the saliva is necessary to to protect your mouth against bacteria, viruses, fungus, things like that. And now you've taken away all of that. So that's why people get gum disease and cavities and stuff is, is a lot of that mouth breathing. So 
you're dry, so you're mm. thinking, oh, I need water. But water doesn't do anything because as soon as you take a sip, you go back to the breathing, mm-hmm. it's dry again, and you just go back and forth and you're doesn't never, really ever you're do anything. You're never going to win that battle. Yeah, yeah. Never, never, nothing's ever good. It's going to happen. Um, so I guess maybe you explain this, but how does how do, once you fix all of that, then the body is able to heal better? Is that? So the first thing is to get upright posture. Then the next thing is to accelerate the healing, Okay. So we have special laser systems that accelerate healing. So we can have the time that it takes the body to heal. These lasers accelerate the kind of uh, workhorse of the of the cell called the mitochondria, Mm -hmm. and it turns over proteins and the cells replicate at a faster rate than they normally would. So swelling, pain, everything goes down. I published a study on that some years ago. Um, We're able to get a 50% reduction in pain every time we use the laser system so that we can chase this out, okay? And so basically, you're helping the body heal itself. And one of the big things that we can do to help the body heal itself is diet, is have a Mm -hmm. a proper diet. If you're eating things that cause you inflammation, well, now you're fighting your body, okay? You're making it harder for it to heal. So we try to create an environment that is the optimum healthiest environment for your body to heal and give it what it needs to heal and it will you're you're a perfect example and inflammation is you, is key well, earlier you were explaining something uh, pretty pretty interesting to me that uh, you were saying that some inflammation is is good inflammation can you kind of explain that yeah well, so so first of all just um, kind of go through inflammation yeah with, so with so we so you know inflammation is key for us okay it, it, uh, at the beginning of treatment, uh, interesting, we try to decrease it. Later, we try to increase it. Sounds odd, but, <laughs> but, but understanding that inflammation is the precursor of all pathology. So everything that, you know, is not working started with inflammation. Um, so, so in that sense, we want to decrease it so you have less pain. Inflammation is the precursor of pain. So you work on inflammation, and then you de- re- decrease pain. What medicine has done for a long time and never made sense to me is opioids, okay? I've been doing this for a lot of years, and I don't prescribe any narcotics because I never understood the purpose. You know, um, you have to know how how those things work on people in pain, okay? First of all, they don't make you not have pain. Um, They take the edge off, but, but you still have the pain. It just makes it a little more manageable. Problem is you get used to it, so you have to have higher and higher doses mm-hmm. in order to relieve it. And you know, honestly, where it really came to uh, my understanding was my mom. My mom never ever took any medicine her whole life. I mean, I think I maybe saw her take an aspirin once or something. Never drank, um, but she ended up uh, dying of pancreatic cancer, and it is extremely painful. Okay, it's it's horrible to watch and. In her case, it was a blessing that it was only three months, okay? Yeah. But it, it, it was miserable. And so I saw my mom taking these opioids. And, you know, she's Percocet, started out oxycodone, just everything that was available. And I could look in her eyes and I could see it wasn't doing anything. So the more pain you have, um, the less effective it is, okay? And so I, it, I'm treating people in pain. I'm watching my mom and I'm re- recognizing that, Holy crud, you know, yeah. it really doesn't work. However, if you work on inflammation, the precursor, then that person has less pain. So it always made sense to me, work on the origin, work on inflammation, and then you don't need the, the opioids. So I, I, I don't think in the last 25 years I've prescribed any kind of opioid because <clears throat> it doesn't work. And now we've seen how that has all changed the, yeah you know that whole you know pandemic epidemic that we had with narcotics right that's not so we had changed our philosophy so we center on inflammation so so if you cut yourself then you're going to see inflammation that's good okay because now it's bringing in cells to heal that and so the inflammation triggers mast cells to come in that release serotonin and different uh, neurotransmitters that then um, tell the body to heal uh, this, this structure. So that's good. That's acute inflammation, and that's proper, and that's normal healing. But what if you have an ongoing issue? Let's say your jaw, okay? 
and your jaw is still moving when you got injured with a fist and all night it's been doing this and keeps doing it and that's why it never recovers okay it never heals because it never got a break it was constantly irritated and so now that becomes a chronic injury okay and a chronic injury the body kind of walls it off and says you know listen we can't really fix this so we're just gonna try to avoid it and that's where you get shifting of structure and things like that or the chronic inflammation of the rubbing, which is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis means overuse of a joint. So okay. you can get overuse of anything, okay? And then it starts melting. So the, the joint starts melting away. So the jaw melt, would start melting. You can get to the point where people have to have an artificial jaw, just like you have an artificial hip or knee or anything else. So if you're a marathon runner, and you, or an ultra marathon, you keep beating it up, beating it up until you wear it out. So it's overuse. That's what that means. Osteoarthritis mm -hmm. means overuse of a joint. It, it okay. means that you weren't born that way, and you don't have rheumatoid arthritis, which is a genetic predisposition for those things. You just overused it, okay? And so that's why we got to figure out what's causing the overuse. So we treat a chronic inflammation different than acute. And so that's why we're mm -hmm. saying inflammation yeah. is good. It's normal. It's what's proper. But if it goes on too long, then it, it works against you. So when you see that osteoarthritis, mm -hmm. your, your brain goes to inflammation. Is that correct? Or? Well, I'm just saying the like, chronic overuse chronic, yeah. causes inflammation. Oh, it causes inflammation. Okay, and I then got the you. inflammation yeah. and the precursors of all that um, now have a very low pH and it changes all the properties. And now the way the protein is produced now starts breaking down and instead of growing new tissue it starts going away okay yeah. well, we were laughing earlier the human body is amazing it, it is amazing it is um, amazing and it'll work for you if if yeah, um, i think like something that you said that. earlier at lunch was was really encouraging is that it doesn't really matter what age that this can really help you no matter you know <laughs> where you're at in your journey that's <laughs> right that's right uh, so people ask me, you know, yeah. have people come in, well, I'm 80, you know, or whatever, and, uh, you know, will this work for me? And I go, well, it, it works, um, yeah, it works, it work on anybody, and, you know, if you're alive, it works, you know, because <laughs> to be alive, you have to replace tissue every day, mm -hmm. so you can heal, okay, and if you scratch yourself, you're still going to heal, um, I say when when it stops working <laughs> is the day after you die. Then after that, it's not going to work. <laughs> Nothing happens. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's pretty funny. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about because I find this interesting. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the relationship with this and, and other. Um, I don't know what the word is. Other places in healthcare. Other other ways of attacking things because. I truly believe that everybody means well. You know, um, your, your neuro, I mean, you've got so many different disciplines, maybe is the word I'm looking for. How does what you do, how do you work with those um, different disciplines, and how does, that, how does everything kind of tie together as far as you and your practice? Well, again, we have to triage what the problems are. So, like in your case, you know, um, we had to work, or Dr. Morris had to work with a, um, sleep physician to get a diagnosis about what your problems are okay so we're dentists we can't make a medical diagnosis so we need a physician to evaluate a person to find out does this person breathe okay at night or if if what is their sleep disturbance is it breathing is it something else sometimes people have like a neurochemistry problem where they're just waking up for some reason some people wake up because they have a painful hip or back and they roll over and that wakes them up 50 percent of insomnia, of not being able to get to sleep, is because of pain. So if you're hurting all day, and now you want to lay down and go to sleep, but you're pumping all this adrenaline and cortisol, yeah. and you can't go to sleep. That's why people drink or do something, whatever, to knock themselves out. But if you medicate yourself to go to sleep, it screws up your sleep even more. Okay, so what it does is it shortens sleep time. It takes you from restful, deeper sleep to lighter sleep, so your sleep's you know less restful, and then it decreases rapid eye movement sleep. So now you can't remember things. Okay, mm -hmm. that's where your cognitive memory is consolidated. Mm -hmm. So you have to understand when you medicate. Yeah, you're staying asleep, but you're really uh, your body is really getting more beat up than yeah. if if you were even struggling without the drugs. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
And there's protective mechanisms. Um, you're, some people, it's not just pain. That you're, you have, you, you, Your brain works by survival instincts, okay? So if your brain knows that if you go uh, become unconscious or go to sleep, you're going to stop breathing. You're going to suffocate. And your brain goes, listen, I'm going to protect you against suffocation by keeping you awake. And you're like, it doesn't matter how tired you are, you still can't go to sleep. That's the drive of survival for your brain. Mm. And that's why we see people in that situation that when we treat the breathing problem, now they can go to sleep because they're yeah. not fighting that mechanism. So we're working on the pain, we're working on the breathing, and then we're working on neurofunction. So those are all the things. So we work with neurologists, we work with sleep physicians, we work with all manual uh, manipulators. So mm -hmm. chiropractor, PT, orthopedic surgeon, whatever we need, you know, podiatrists, uh, endocrinologists, you know, whatever specialty of medicine yeah. that's, that's necessary for that person, that's, that's, it's a team approach, yeah. okay? Because people have already gone to all these people separately. Mm -hmm. And as I say, if you have multiple systems problem, one person is not going to be able to help you. And, and that's why there has to be a team approach. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do. We work with um, and, and to be able to know who we need when we need them. And, and that's, that is key. That is very, very important. And yeah. The, yeah. The day he flew in um, to come do our training, he stopped in Lafayette for a day and he practiced with a physical therapist yeah. there. So they, they saw patients together all day. So that's pretty cool. Yeah, and I like that approach, and I and I think that it's important for people to understand that because you're not saying, "Hey, this is it's it's my approach, and everybody else is bad, and mm. this and that." What you're saying is, "Hey, let's not worry about who's right, right, and wrong. Let's just get to the root of the problem." Mm -hmm. And really, that's what all patients want. Nobody cares, yeah, like yeah. we said. Yeah, um, and and we can only do so much. So yeah. we recognize, well, we can do this part. Yeah, and you can do that part and this part. And, but none of us are going to be successful unless we all get together. And that's kind of the message, you know. Yeah. So, so we're looking at, um, at headaches. We're looking at airway obstruction, sleep apnea, snoring, mm -hmm. um, TMJ disorders, neck and head Clen pain, clenching, all different types of pain. Mm -hmm. clenching, clenching. I was grinding. grinding my teeth together really bad. Mm -hmm. So any of those things that I named. Ear stuff. Ear, ear okay, ear yeah. things. So if anybody's watching this that, is having trouble with any of that, they may be a, a perfect candidate to maybe come over and talk to Dr. Morris about, um, Absolutely. about this. Absolutely, yeah. because, you know, I think what she can do is that um, um, we're not saying that we can handle everything, but what we can do is, is find out um, if that person can utilize our services or we know who to send them to to mm -hmm. get relief for that particular problem. And so we kind of feel like we can help most people, maybe not directly, but then by the referral, a proper referral to the right mm -hmm. person to, to make sure that it gets taken care of. It's like that. Yeah. And you've had, I, I, I watched another interview with you, and, and I probably got the number wrong, but I think you said something about your patients have, is it a 2% surgery or something like that? Am I making that up? No, that's... Fairly accurate. I, I'm trying to remember um, the last person that would need um, like a total joint replacement. Um, it, it, see, what we're trying to do is prevent that. Yeah. Um, and what most people do, uh, practitioners, is try to cover up the problem. So they'll give you pain meds. They'll do Botox. They'll do everything they can to cover up the problem. But the, but the actual problem is getting worse every day. Mm -hmm. And so if you cover it up long enough, by the time you have to do something, now it's, it's likely a total joint replacement. What we try to do is be intervention at the point wherever this person comes to us in their timeline, mm -hmm. and then address the problem, address the origin, and then rehabilitate it. Because once the inflammation's gone and you've restored proper function, then the shape of things becomes more normal. It doesn't grow back to mm -hmm. where it was originally, but it takes the shape of normal function. So we have a thing in medicine, form follows function. You have abnormal function, you're going to have abnormal form. But when you correct all the things that produce it, then everything starts returning back to normal. So it's mm -hmm. kind of like that. Yeah. And I can't tell you how many patients that have come in with severe osteoarthritic jaws that most people would probably cut out that we're able to rehabilitate. And that's, that's I can show you thousands of cases. Wow. And I've treated people 
literally all over the world. We have centers throughout the U.S., Canada, coast to coast. We have four centers in Australia. We have a center in New Zealand. We have three in the U.K. We have one in Dubai. We have one in Bahrain. So I've, I've been all over the world, and people are the same, <laughs> and they have the same problems. And it works in all those places, at least yeah. all the places I've been to so far. Yeah. Man, that's, it's, it's amazing, and I'm glad that I, I'm glad that, I'm glad that um, Casey made the call to me that day. I'm grateful. We go back a long ways, and she was like, hey, I may, I'm just calling you. I may you. be able to. Yeah, and he, she was know. like, I'm just calling you because I care about you, and I, and I want to see you get better, and I can see you struggling. And I was really at a bad place. Like, uh, you know, um, as I mentioned earlier today, uh, too, I told you I was, I was in a bad place mentally at that point. Oh, yeah. It, it, it had transferred. My back was still hurting, but I was – it had become more mental than than anything at that point, and that's a really bad place to be. Oh, I, I, you know, in chronic pain, you know, you deal with people who depleted. They're just so <laughs> depleted. <laughs> they're, this word, they're depleted. So, they're so exhausted, and um, you know, when you lose your hope, then fast-moving trains and buses and steep stairways start to look good to you. You yeah, know, you just yeah. need it to end. Yeah. And, you know, that's kind of the problem I have with letting go too early, um, putting people in pain management. You know, I yeah. see people's reaction when you tell them you have to go to pain management because what they hear is, oh, you're giving up on me. Mm -hmm. And you're like, yeah, pretty much. You know, we're yeah. gonna you're gonna be in pain the rest of your life, so we're gonna give you counseling. We're gonna give you medication regimens. We're gonna so uh, you know we're gonna give you cognitive behavior stuff. So basically, yeah, you're gonna have to live with it because there's no chance of you ever getting better. When you take someone's hope away, then what is there? Yeah. You know. And so we try to do everything we can. And I can't tell you how many situations I've been in where people were at that point suicidal. Mm -hmm. And we were able to help them. And, and that's sincere. And I've done that all over the world. And yeah. so that's, that's so empowering, you know, and that's why we're motivated to do it because it's the honest thank yous, right? From, from giving someone's life back, normal life yeah. back to them. And it's exciting. And when we can do it and it all works, wow. You yeah. know what? It's yeah. a really good feeling. Yeah. Well, uh, what made you want to, because for 27 years, you've been exclusive to this. You, you don't practice dentistry anymore. Is that correct? No, I, I stopped doing dentistry. So yeah. What made there. you, what was there an event or was it like just, what was that? Was there a point that well, just made you, you know, want to um, in? I've, I've been treating this longer than 27 years, but that's when I stopped doing dentistry mm -hmm. and did this exclusively. So, you know what the frustration is as, as, as me being a dentist was, is that people come in and they're in pain, you know, their jaw hurts, their face hurts, and headaches. And, and so, you know, we, we were kind of trained a little bit on that, but not very much. And so the thought process is you send them to the surgeon. So I used to send them to the oral surgeons, and then they, they didn't make them better either. They didn't know really what to do to make them better. And then we, I go, oh, well, it must be the orthodontist that knows. So I would send them to the orthodontist. And they, they didn't fix them. Oh, it must be the prosthodontist that knows how to do it. Okay, so I'd send them to them. And mm -hmm. they didn't make them better either. So it was so frustrating that, that, what do I do with these people? And I feel bad for them. And so that's when I started taking courses and tried to learn something about mm -hmm. it. And you have some successes and you have some failures. And you really want it to be more consistent, you know. Because, um, you know, in dentistry, if we do things, I mean, gosh, it's, it's a 98% <laughs> success. You know, mm -hmm. like that's broken. You fix it. You know, you're good. Like a mechanic. But, yeah. yeah, like a mechanic. But, but in this world, it's far more complex. And so that's what attracted me is the complexity. You have, your knowledge base has to be a hundred times what our basic education was. And so I find that intriguing and I really wanted to figure out how do we help people? So I kept doing that. And then there's all these philosophies on how to help people. There's all these dental and medical organizations. And so I started joining all these things and I wanted to learn everybody's point of view. And so then I took their board exams. That's why I have so many board certifications and things <laughs> because 
I wanted to understand from everybody's perspective and then try to find out what works and doesn't. Whatever, you know, somebody would say, do this, I'd go back to my practice and see if it worked. If it didn't work, okay, I'd go try something else. So over time, you know, I started to put these things together. And I got to the point where I just needed to do something different than just dentistry, okay? Yeah. And so I had to go home and tell my wife that. <laughs> that wasn't an easy conversation. <laughs> and, um, and so, you know what I did? I, I um, sold my practice to my associate, and I, just, I went to courses, I went to offices, but basically I locked myself in uh, my office, and I read, like, I don't know, 10, 12, 14 hours a day sometimes. And because I was trying to relearn the things that, you know, we, we went and had courses on in school, but you're not, in, the, in this case, I was really trying to learn it, not, not trying to memorize it for a test. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. And the things we learned were not practical. So I wanted to learn it from a medical perspective. I already understood things from a dental perspective, but in reality, what we're talking about are medical issues. So I treat chronic pain. That's a medical problem. I treat orthopedic problems of the jaw. It's a medical problem. I treat nerve injuries. That's a medical problem. I treat chronic headache, you know, uh, from uh, what we call primary. So there's no organic reason. Like mm -hmm. if you had a tumor, you'd go to a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. But when the MRI is negative and your head hurts, well, that's what we treat. Okay, mm -hmm. so headaches and all those things. And the breathing problems, those are all medical problems. So I had to learn it from a medical perspective. So that's what I taught myself. I taught myself physiology and anatomy and neurology, and I just did it. And then I wanted to know, well, how do I know I know this? So I went and go took their exams. So you sat the on board the boards of all of these. So I took all the board exams <laughs> so I could demonstrate to myself that I do understand these things, right? Because how do you know, you, you know unless pretty, you test yourself? That's pretty impressive. So, so then I did that. And by doing so and learning all these perspectives, I came to my own protocol, you know, of, of how we do things. And now that's what I teach ev everyone else. Mm -hmm. Because I got to a point where um, I was thinking, you know, I, I could just keep working in San Diego and I could work seven days a week and I could work 24 hours a day, but I'd still only help X number of people. Mm -hmm. And then I started to realize, what if I taught other dentists how to do these things that I found successful. And so I started lecturing and I started sharing it. And um, because the thought process is that if I teach other people how to help other people, I feel like I could have a bigger effect. So I started out in the US and then went to Canada and everywhere mm -hmm. I went to lecture, there were more people that are smart, <laughs> like Dr. Morris, and, and got what I was saying mm -hmm. and had a passion to help other people. Because this is different. We're we're different. <laughs> we're, we're, we're not like the average person, you know. Mm -hmm. Whoever wants to do this really has to make a commitment. This is a, this is a lot of education and training. I don't know how many <laughs> thousands of hours you put in in your CE and your personal learning. Uh, and she's, she's board certified. So, you know, we, we spend a lot of time doing this, mm -hmm. okay. And so there's a real commitment if, you, if you're serious about this. And um, so that's how we've developed it. So wherever I've gone to share it, you know, throughout the Middle East and wherever in, the, in Europe, um, I'm going to South Africa. I, I just did a presentation for the um, uh, South African Dental Association. So they asked me to go do a course down there. I'm certain probably something will start. We're doing one in India. So uh, I don't know where this is going to end, but um, I'm motivated to keep sharing, yeah. you know, because you don't know where there's more people like her. And at his courses, the, the ones I've been to lately, it's more. there's a lot of dentists, but there's also chiropractors, ENTs, osteopaths, orthopedic surgeons. It's kind of everybody. So you're seeing these people from these other disciplines starting to reach out and say, hey, well, the, what a, what, what's going on over here? Well, let, the, whole let me purpose, the whole purpose is to build bridges between yeah. medicine and dentistry, which don't exist. So for five years, um, I was at the University of Tennessee. So I had a clinic there where I treated children with breathing disorders. Okay, So we had... Uh, the pediatric sleep facility Le Bonheur down the street, and they would refer to me at the dental school. Okay? And I'd fly in once a month to take care of these kids. So these kids were usually five when they were put on CPAP breathing machines, uh, which actually magnify on a kid uh, because the device 
is arresting development. Well, the rest of their head's growing, but the part of their breathing is getting worse. Mm -hmm. And so I would get them at age 10, and by then, they were severe. But I would look in their records, and originally they were like mild or moderate. So it was that, their problem was getting worse. So we had to come up with dynamic things to reverse that process. And we were able to show how, how we could do that. Now I, now I do research with um, people like Judy Owens from Harvard and um, Rakesh Bhattacharchi, who's well published, and he's the head of um, Children's Hospital, Radies Children's Hospital in San Diego. So we, we publish. And that's one of the things we do with our centers is that we're data collection sites. See, we, we all do the same things, so we can pull data from all of our sites. And now we publish, okay, with some of these very special uh, collaborators. And see, that's very powerful literature. Mm -hmm. See, if you just do it out of one facility, okay, you know. But when you can standardize a technique, and that's really what I call science, right? Science is doing uh, these steps in a reproducible way yeah. and, get a, and get a fixed result. Well, that's what we've proven, is that if we all do the same thing and we're all getting the same yeah, result, not, it's it doesn't anecdotal, matter. I mean, yeah, it doesn't, yeah. right. Yeah. It doesn't matter where that person goes, is that um, she'll get an equal result, I will, if we both do the same things to that person, yeah. okay? And so that's, I think, the power of it. Multi-center data collection research is the highest level yeah. because... Um, you can't get two facilities to agree to each other. Mm -hmm. So what I used to do is host symposiums. And I would host like the top people in medicine, and then I would bring in the top people in dentistry, and we would have joint meetings, okay, and to try to establish how do we work together. And I did that for like five years, you know, uh, at, at UT. And I've kind of continued that process. Mm -hmm. And that's what our courses have evolved to. Like the courses I teach now, um, I have a neurology. I have a professor of neurology teaching neurology at my courses. I have a radiologist teaching courses. I have a sleep a physician sleep specialist. I have an ENT that all collaborate with me teaching dentists. That's why we're bringing in all. So it's really a uniform delivery system mm -hmm. where it used to be just me teaching all these things. <clears throat> let me, let me jump in and ask. Um, I'm just curious, these other disciplines, were, were they accepting up front or did well, they give even, you a lot of... even your own profession has bias, okay? Yeah. So what is it, the definition of truth? Was it Arthur Schoenheimer, uh, uh, the German philosopher? He said, uh, truth goes through three phases, right? So ver first it's ridiculed, then it's violently opposed, and then it's recognized as self-evident. Yeah. So that's kind of my life. <laughs> well, it's amazing. I'm serious. I'm, I find it fascinating. I mean, that's a lot of that arrows you've... back there, Doc. That's <clears throat> a lot of arrows back there. Well, that's how you know you're in front. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I find it fascinating, though. I mean, it's that you've pioneered this um, this uh, philosophy of of treatment, and um, you you were saying something earlier, and I don't want to keep you all night. I got a couple more questions, and so, we'll get out. But um, you said something earlier that that was really I think I, w I want you to say it again because it really stuck in, in my head. But you were talking about three weeks without food, three weeks without. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think so, that analogy is great for people to hear. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, I just find it amazing that the most vital function of a human being is the least evaluated by uh, healthcare professionals. So if you think about, uh, okay, so food, well, you can go three weeks without eating. Uh, water, you can go three days without drinking water. But if you can go three minutes without breathing, that's pretty good, okay? <laughs> so, so breathing is the most vital function. Uh, taking a breath is the first thing you do and the last thing you do, okay? So life is what happens between those two points. And who evaluates breathing? Like if you go to your physician, if you go to whoever, you know, whatever healthcare person you go to, mm -hmm. Are they evaluating your breathing? Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's certainly better today than it was five years ago. And good, we're making inroads. That's why exposure, like your program and all these things, is really helpful because people need to know. Um, you know, uh, the American Heart Association says that there's such a high comorbidity. The literature is so profound between cardiovascular disease and breathing disorders. 
how come everybody that goes to a cardiologist isn't being evaluated for a breathing problem? Okay, so heart, that's how you die, heart attack and stroke. So cardiovascular disease is the number one reason why you die. Mm -hmm. And it is very much comorbid or linked to not being able to breathe, okay, especially at night. Yeah. Well, how come, so that's a perfect example of why aren't we checking everybody? Yeah. You know, 50% of all high-risk pregnancies um, are related to a sleep breathing disorder by the mother. It's a massive okay? number. So, so half, half of all pregnancies where, you know, we might lose either one is because mom can't breathe. And she's what we call hypoxic. She doesn't have enough oxygen. So the fetus and the baby is, is, is starving for oxygen. Mm -hmm. And that leads to preeclampsia. That leads to premature birth. That leads to small size. And mm -hmm. it also leads to mental uh, deficiency. So IQ scores are much lower in short-term births. Okay? Mm -hmm. so, so why isn't that all women who are thinking about uh, being pregnant or are why aren't they screened? If half of all problems are that, why aren't they screened for a breathing problem? Because if you had a breathing problem, and as you gain weight through the pregnancy, it's magnifying the problem. And that's why there's a lot of uh, pregnancy uh, obstructive sleep apnea, okay? And so those kinds of things really bother me. You know, it's like the literature's there. We just need to change just our putting behavior. putting it together, yeah. yeah. We just need to change our behavior. Yeah. Sorry, I, I get a little Well, and dentists are, I think dentists are the worst. We, you know, we fix teeth. Somebody comes in, they broke the tooth. We fix it like a mechanic, but we don't ever look to say, why did they break it? Mm -hmm. You know, we're the worst. Yeah, well. Good point. I, I think that this is fascinating, and it's something that I'm glad that, that I was able to, uh, to get both of you guys on. Um, but I know Dr. Morris told me so much about you. I felt like I already knew you. Um, but, I mean, it's a... It's, it's truly an honor to have one of the, the top doctors on the planet here and, and a pioneer who's just sort of trailblazing the, the whole thing, and especially when it impacted me personally. This isn't something that I'm just, you know, you, you're not paying me money or anything. This is something that mm -hmm. I, I genuinely um, believe in because I've lived it. And um, but that, That's the real story. I mean, yeah. we could sit here and talk about stuff all day long, <laughs> but it, but but the but that's real what mm -hmm. happened to you was real okay mm -hmm. so it's not made up we're not selling a product or anything we're just saying you know look you're a human yeah. being that was destined to have fusion surgery and have titanium implanted in you yeah. and now you don't so and w we were laughing off camera because i was saying that whenever i first looked at the little thing in my nose and my mouthpiece i was like there's <laughs> I feel like I'm putting on a football <laughs> helmet to go to sleep or something like that. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to sleep. I mean, I, it was a genuine fear. And after maybe like one day or two days, I mean, now I can't live, I can't sleep without it. Oh, yeah. Um, I was telling you that yeah. I'll, I'll wake up if I fall asleep reading or something like that. I'll wake up and where's my mouthpiece? Yeah. You know, I, I need it. Right. And, um, and I mean, it just, you, you become so used to it. And you get used to that quality of sleep, and yeah. I can't go back now. <laughs> yeah. No, I know exactly how you feel. Yeah. I have the same problem. Mm -hmm. I have I have sleep apnea, and um, I have to sleep with a device. And if I don't, if if, I, if that happens to me, what you just said, <laughs> I, my heart's racing. Yeah. And it's so funny because that's what patients say. They go, "Oh, I don't think I could get used to that." You know, I don't think that's you know. So uh, you know, you I can. tell them, "Listen, you know, just wear it for an hour before you go to bed, so you get used to it. It's really hard if you're going to go to sleep and you stick it in your mouth, and then all of a sudden you're thinking about it. <laughs> but if you had it in your mouth and you're reading, watching TV or something, you're like, oh, "Okay, now I'm ready to go to bed." It's just a lot easier transition. Mm -hmm. And once you start seeing how much better you feel, then that's when you go, there's no way I'm taking, I'm sleeping without this thing. So uh, yeah. I, I 100% know how you feel. <laughs> yeah, I just went on a two-week trip yeah. and I kept checking my bag. I checked it like five times to make sure that I had it. <laughs> I, mean, it's, I know that. The, the fear was real. Um, so, yeah, so I guess we'll end on um, what what would you say, what would you just like to say to anyone out there that's, that's got some of these issues, that's struggling with chronic pain, that's just looking for answers. Maybe they've tried all kind of different things and they're lost. Mm -hmm. What's sort of the one message that you would like to say to anybody out there listening? 
Yeah, if 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 um, if you're getting if you're trying treatment or you recognize you have a problem and you haven't been to anybody, that you know you you, you need to have a starting point, you know, and um, so you can you can go to your primary care, but you have to understand that dentists and doctors did not get any training in the things we're speaking of. You know, we get one hour per year on the subjects we just talked about. Okay, so you would think the doctor knows more, or you know, whatever somebody knows. Well, no, we weren't trained in this stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's why you know, if you go to a place that's dedicated to doing that, and like Dr. Morris here, you know, you're in this community. Um, there you go. There's, there's not another person like this mm -hmm. who can triage and figure out. Maybe she's not the person to help, but she knows who can help you, mm -hmm. and that is a service in itself. So um, that would be the thing, you know, if you have headaches that nobody's resolving, if your jaw has issued that nobody's resolving, face pain, if, you're, if your neck is killing you, you know, uh, mm -hmm. nerve injuries, all these things that we're speaking about. If your ear, you have ear pain and nobody's been able to resolve that, you know, those are all things that she can help with and um, figure out why. Yeah. Well, we're going to put your website on the screen so people can learn more about you and follow you. Um, Dr. Morris has got me a copy of your book and I can't wait to, to read it. We'll put your book on the screen also. Um, just because I, I want people to follow you and, and, and the things that you're doing because you're, you're always learning and you're ever evolving and it's, and it trickles down to Dr. Morris, which trickles down to the Miss Lou community and trickles down to, to people like me. And, um, I think it's important. And, and Dr. Morris is, uh, it's TMJ and Sleep Therapy Center of Southwest Mississippi. And it's at the Miss Lou Dental Building over by Stein. So, and we'll put, we'll put that address and the phone number. Um, so anybody can reach out to you for, uh, how does that work if, if somebody wants to come in, uh, just so they'll, so, so they'll know the process? Well, right now it's in our physical building at Stein's. It may not always be there, but I operate out of the Miss Lou Dental Building at Stein's. So mm -hmm. just call there. Um, they therapy. would come in for an evaluation, sit down, and just kind of talk Not to you. Not a dental appointment. It's separate. Yeah, separate. Yeah. So separate. But, but they would come down and say, this is yes. what's going on. And, and then if we you, can help them, yeah. we do that, and then you go back to your normal dentist. Okay. Awesome. Well, I, I certainly appreciate you guys coming out. and uh, Like I said, it's an honor. I mean, it really is. It's really Thank great you. to meet you. I feel like I already knew a lot about you, but it's really great to meet you and have you have you on our show. Um, we want to say thank you to everyone out there watching this. I hope that that you guys learned as much and find this as fascinating as I do. Um, thank you to all of our partners out there. God bless everybody watching this. And as always, have a champion day. like what we're doing here at Miss Lou Champion Spotlight, make sure to like, follow, share on Facebook and Instagram, and visit our website, MissLouChampions.com. It costs you nothing, and it helps us to continue to shine the spotlight on awesome people right here in our community.